Welcome to Vanadium. I'm Chris Rankin. The more I learn about this mad world, the more mysterious it seems. There is a mysterious condition, one known since the dawn of civilization, but to a large degree still unexplained. It affects a few out of a hundred people throughout their lives, across all nationalities and cultures. The experience has different names. Psychosis, psychotic break, madness. It's been investigated and pondered by philosophy, religion, and science. Those who suffer are seen by others as both gifted and cursed, depending on the cultural perspective. It can be caused by schizophrenia, drugs, and health problems, sometimes unexpectedly for indeterminate reasons. For some, it lasts days, for some weeks, and for others, recovery from psychosis never comes. It's a loss of familiarity with the world, a radical rupture of ego, a cascade of errors in the brain's information processing. Psychosis is mental illness when it growls and shows its teeth. It's hallucinations, auditory and visual, some familiar, some alien. It's an influx of novelty. Psychosis brings delusions and insights. It's more than just a glitch in a computer because the mind is far more than just a computer. The outcome of this fever of consciousness depends on the strength of the sufferer and the strength of those around them. Recovery also depends on perspective. Philosopher of heroism and hero of the show, Joseph Campbell wrote in The Psychology of the Future, the psychotic drowns in the same waters in which the mystic swims with delight. Psychosis has been described since at least the fourth century BC by Hippocrates and possibly as early as 1500 BC by the ancient Egyptians. The term stems from modern Latin, meaning to give life or soul to, or animating, or quickening. In the United States, about 3% of people develop psychosis at some point in their lives. It affects men and women equally and occurs across all cultures and socioeconomic groups. It usually first appears in a person's late teens or early 20s. Friedrich Nietzsche, or Friedrich Nietzsche, depending on your pronunciation, in Beyond Good and Evil wrote, Madness is something rare in individuals, but in groups, parties, people, and ages, it is the rule. Written record of supernatural causes of psychosis and treatments can be traced back to the New Testament. Mark 5.8.13 describes a man displaying what would today be described as psychotic symptoms. Jesus cured this demonic madness by casting out the demons and hurling them into a herd of swine. There are times when the mind is dealt such a blow that it hides itself in insanity. While this may not seem beneficial, it is. There are times when reality is nothing but pain, and to escape that pain, the mind must leave reality behind, said Patrick Rothfuss in The Name of the Wind. A psychotic break means losing contact with reality, hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling, feeling things that have no external correlate. Psychosis brings delusions, or believing something to be true, even though it is false and fantastic. Ideas become increasingly disordered and tangential. Emotions become wildly inconsistent with external reality. Early civilizations considered madness a supernaturally inflicted phenomenon, the work of demons and spirits. Archaeologists have discovered skulls with clearly visible drilling marks, some dating back to 5000 BC. This suggests trepanning was a treatment for psychosis in ancient times. 18th century physician, educator, and a man generally considered the founder of American psychiatry, Benjamin Rush, that genius, prescribed and promoted bloodletting as a first-line treatment for psychosis. Such an enlightened field, psychiatry. In his paper, The Loss of Reality in Neurosis and Psychosis from 1924, Sigmund Freud differentiates between psychosis and neurosis, writing that the imaginary world of a psychosis attempts to put itself in the place of external reality, while the imaginary world remains as a fantasy in neurosis. Frequently the cause is a severe mental illness such as schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Some psychiatric medications such as benzodiazepines and stimulants can precipitate psychosis. Also, the use of corticosteroids and the associated withdrawal can bring an episode on. A number of medical conditions are also known to cause psychosis, including 
neurodegenerative disorders such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, stroke, brain tumors, multiple sclerosis, and some form of epilepsy. Also, viral encephalitis, malaria, and syphilis. A lot of things can bring on a psychosis. Psychotic breaks are associated with endocrine diseases such as Cushing's syndrome, hyperthyroidism, and hypothyroidism. Autoimmune disorders such as lupus, sarcoidosis, and Hashimoto's encephalopathy. Sex hormones can also affect psychotic symptoms, and sometimes giving birth can provoke psychosis. This is referred to as postpartum psychosis. Also, nutritional deficiency, such as vitamin B12 deficiency, or too low or high calcium or magnesium can bring on psychosis. One of the things that scientists have noticed that's helped them start to figure out the chemical puzzle. Many drugs known to induce psychosis experimentally are brain dopamine receptor agonists. This means these drugs flood the brain with dopamine and this brings on psychotic effects. Blocking dopamine receptors and decreasing dopaminergic activity continues to be the main strategy to treat psychosis. It's still a largely misunderstood phenomenon in our society. Most people won't experience it but they will know it when they see it. Other than transient drug-induced psychoses, most people don't snap into it. They slide gradually, and they can slide in and out. People do recover, sometimes temporarily and sometimes permanently. When it comes to how modern society handles the problem, writer Charles Bukowski documented this interesting observation in his book, Ham on Rye. I have noticed that both in the very poor and very rich extremes of society, the mad were often allowed to freely mingle. In a mad world, only the mad are sane, said Akira Kurosawa. I and all crazy people like that quote a lot. In 1913, at the age of 38, Carl Jung, the founder of analytical psychology, suffered a deep and long psychotic episode he began to hear voices and suffer terrible dreams and hallucinations. One reason for the enigma surrounding Carl Jung's Red Book is that he wasn't able to actually finish it. The haunting book ends mid-sentence, just after its author concedes, my acquaintance with alchemy took me away from it. And then it just ends. Carl Jung later wrote that he was menaced by psychosis. Had it been current times, he probably would have been prescribed antipsychotic drugs just to silence the condition. He used the opposite tactic, riding what he called his descent into madness. He began to engage the voices that spoke to him and recorded his experiences in a series of black books. He would later compile these into a single volume, what would come to be called the Red Book. Written in stylish calligraphy and illustrated with intricate mandalas and scenes from Young's visions, the Red Book looks and reads more like a work of art than a memoir. Written in stylish calligraphy and illustrated with intricate mandalas and scenes from Jung's visions, the Red Book looks and reads more like a work of art than a memoir. Both confusing and fascinating, it's a mix of science, myth, and mysticism. Jung worked on the Red Book until 1930. He wasn't in a big hurry to publish it, fearing that its unconventional content would cast dispersions on his ideas and scholarship. However, he considered it his most important work. Jung spoke of the Red Book, saying, The years of which I've spoken to you, when I pursued the inner images, were the most important time of my life. All my work, all my creative activity, has come from those initial fantasies and dreams. The large, leather-bound volume, shown to very few, was kept in a locked cupboard in his home near Zurich until 23 years after his death in 1961. After that, his family had the book moved to a bank lockbox. This only served to intensify the mystery and rumors surrounding the Red Book. However, in the late 1990s, after years of attempts to convince Carl Jung's heirs that the book deserves an audience, Sonu Shamdasani, a professor of psychology at University College London, was finally given permission to translate and seek publication for the Red Book. It's a strange document. It's not just a book. It's somehow imbued with Carl Jung's mystical, psychotic experience. The Red Book seems almost too personal. Fascinating, but kind of a violation of his spiritual space. 
The red book is haunted, I think. One of my favorite eerie parts of the book. Every step closer to my soul excites the scornful laughter of my devils, those cowardly ear whisperers and poison mixers. Thank you very much. This was Chris Rankin with Vanadium.